So on that note, we're going to start with uh, Ms. Norma Gibbs. I don't need to introduce her, but I will. I love on TV during political seasons, we all hear about, you hear about Hillary Clinton, and you hear about Elizabeth Warren, and you hear about every female that runs. We had all that and more in the 60s in Norma Gibbs. We had a woman, and she got things done, she, she did it in a man's world, and she didn't take no for an answer. She was tenacious, she remains tenacious. She was the first woman elected to the Huntington Beach City Council, uh, first female mayor, and she's going to talk to you right now. Norma, it is an honor to be with you and to hear you speak. Thank you. Well, thank you very much. Well, please vote for me. I'm not running for a thing. <laughs> well, back in the old days, well, I had the honor of being on that city council uh, in 1970. And I, I recall like yesterday, the meeting that we had at the city council chambers in which we were to decide if we we're going to have a library or not. The mayor at the time was George McCracken. I don't know if any of you remember him, but George started out by saying, who needs a library? <laughs> And we, Don Shipley and I were in cohorts, and we were really pumping for this library and, and in the location. And then he said, nobody reads anymore. Everybody watches television, so who needs a library? Oh, dear. Well, uh, that started it. And so then the next thing was, and you know, we have no money for books. There is nothing in the budget for books, so why even bother with the library? <laughs> well, then I spoke up. And I said, George, Shipley has a library of thousands of books, and he's going to donate them to the library. I have a few hundred books, and I'm going to donate my library to the library. And then Jack Green spoke up and said, George, would you donate both of your books? <laughs> I, well, at that point, we called for the vote, and guess what? It went in favor of the library. But that was really quite funny, I thought. Then we uh, had to open it up for the architect, my goodness, we had so many submissions. But it was almost unanimous to decide on Richard Neutra. And he loved water. Oh my. We had water outside, we had water inside, and there was water flowing here and there and fountains bubbling up. Oh, I just thought it was marvelous. And the city engineer said, who needs the water? <laughs> Look at the pipes. What's going to happen? And they're going to rust out, and then we're going to have leaks, and then we're going to blah, 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 blah. And it was just very negative. So we got water. Oh, I just remembered one other thing. The night that we opened up the library down uh, below, the contractor saw somebody that he knew on the other side of the library, and so he started to go over to shake hands with him. Well, there are pools of water between where he was, and now he was the contractor, so he knew that. But he's waving at this, and he proceeds to go over, and I just happened to be standing there. He just dumps right into one pool, keeps walking, and now he's soaked up to his knees, gets to the other side where he can get up, he gets up, shakes himself off a little bit, and then shakes hands. <laughs> he was soaking wet up to his knees. I thought that was rather funny, too. Well, we did get Neutra, but we did have some problems. Um, the first big problem was he died. I was so mad at him. <laughs> we had gone to all that trouble to select him and he had the nerve to die. Well, then everyone thought, oh, we've got to open it up for another architect. And I thought, no. Dion, his son, was part of the family and was part of the workforce 
why don't we just go ahead with Dion? And we did. And that was fine, except <laughs> Dion was a problem. But we're not going to go into that. I'm just going to tell you the four <laughs> things because that became a bit of a negative because it was between Dion, the architect, I don't know the name of the city engineer, but the two of them just simply had a hard time getting along. And finally, it was so bad that the council said, somebody has got to work with these, and normally, why don't you? <laughs> you know, you're sort of a psychologist, you work with them. And I thought, oh dear. But I did. And I listened to both sides. And from that came the plaque that I am the most proud of, which nobody ever sees because they can't find it. <laughs> and that's when Walt Johnson, on the day we dedicated the library, he went like this. He said, follow me. So I did. And we went down that main pathway to the back of the library. And he said, this is for you. I put this up here because without you, we wouldn't have this library. And all it says, and it's so simple, and I love it, just says Norma Gibbs, she listened. And that's it, I want to end it with that. Thank you. I have to add to as sort of a local historian, I love plaques and markers and things that sort of denote where something took place. When Norma told me about that, I came looking for it and I couldn't find it. And you came and met me here, because it's very subtle, it's very small. And, uh, and you walked me back, and that is my favorite little sign of the city, because it's, it's so little, but it says so much. It's, it's very big in, in a large way. Of course, it, without that little sign, we may not be sitting here today, so thank you very much. Thank you. Okay. Next up. Charlene Bauer. Charlene, um, the Bauer name is obviously very, uh, very notable in Huntington Beach for a variety of reasons. Charlene, you were there at the beginning. You were one of the founders. You were one of the people instrumental in getting the friends going in the library. Go ahead and why don't you talk about your experiences as well, please? Well, first I thought, okay, we're all here because we love the library. First time I met Norma was the at the bookmobile that stopped in front of her house and Eric was in kindergarten and our daughter was three and a half and we walked down to select books. So we've been involved in Huntington Beach Library for a long, long time, 1964. Okay, and I happen to know Richard Neuter from UCLA. He had a home across the street. So he was quite prominent, and everybody who graduated in that era knew his name and which house was his, which was spectacular. So when we, Norma <coughs> put me on the library board, and so I suggested that we ask if he could come down and have a look. <laughs> and he was entranced. He loved looking at the ocean and at the lake behind the library, which is now a meadow. Yeah. <laughs> but anyway, and he wanted to put water everywhere, fountains, and it was great. And Walter Johnson was a librarian and he had a great imagination and he was all for it. So we encouraged him and he came down and he loved our setting and who would have known that a small town like Huntington Beach at the time, we're big now, but we were smaller, and he wanted to come and he, he always said the last thing we would ever do as an individual was select a library book. He thought we'd all just become numbers and everything would be designated for us and the last thing that we would have a personal choice to do would be to select a library book. So it's very, very important. And I'm proud of um, being one of the first to um, start the Friends of the Library. It started in our living room 
And yeah. Nancy, the second or third president, asked me how come I wasn't the president, and I said I was too smart to do that. But, <laughs> <laughs> we were all young and eager and fairly new to Huntington Beach. Um, it really started to grow in the 60s and 70s. We were really rolling along. And <clears throat> the women in the room um, that time were uh, mostly from the American Association of University Women and the League of Women Voters. And they were very eager to get this going. And it, I think it's probably the largest and um, sustaining membership of any of the organizations in Huntington Beach. Um, Rhoda Martin, decided that she would be membership, or she didn't decide, we all decided for her. And no one ever said no to Rhoda, if you remember her. And she, we had printed up little green cards that said you were a member of the Friends of the Library. And Rhoda carried those in her purse, and so did some of the rest of us, and no one said no. Everybody was enthusiastic about becoming a member of the Friends of the Library. And then Olga Robel was elected the first president. And she had the vision and the energy for the great beginning. She saw groups of friends of all ages, from children to retirees. She started the gift store and recruited volunteers so that it would be manned by volunteers every hour that the library was open. Think of that. You had to have a lot of friends who would do what you said if it was going to be that successful. She was the first buyer of appealing merchandise that included the and included a section of for bestsellers to be rented. The store was a success and continues to be each year for 40 years. The friends have donated thousands of dollars to the library in cash but a lot more in time. If the city had had to pay for time, I don't know. <laughs> Olga and some of the other ladies convinced Ray Bradbury to come down for a fundraiser. How many were hit there that night? Okay. <clears throat> you all know Ray Bradbury, so I don't have to tell you. He came down, you knew he didn't drive, so somebody went up and picked him up, brought him down, and he charged us a box of Snickers. <laughs> <laughs> and to raise money, the, art, the friends would have uh, art auctions and lots of other things, but really the bookstore in the beginning um, gift store uh, was the main um, money maker. But now we have so many other things too. <clears throat> Added open shelves, carols, comfortable seatings, meeting rooms, theater, auditorium, they're all right here in the library. And it attracts browsers, students, artists, theater, music supporters, and readers of all descriptions. The Friends have added <coughs> many activities to their enthusiastic support. Um, sorting books, shelving books, selling news books, hosting teas and special parties like the annual Wassail Party. And what brings us here today is the wonderful luncheons with authors, insights, and wonderful food. Thanks to Margo. It t has taken a great deal of volunteer time and dedication to make this library and cultural center what it is today. With special thanks for the leadership today for making the Friends of the Library a continue, continuing vibrant organization. If you have participated in any of those activities, and you have because you're here today, would you give yourself a nice big hand?
Thank you. Last but not least, Ron Hayden started out as a library page, uh, drove the bookmobile, and for 22 years was the director here at Central Library, an incredible legacy. Uh, ladies and gentlemen, Ron Hayden. Thank you, Chris. Um, I guess I'm sort of going to talk about part two of the library. Uh, as Norman mentioned, it was a an event when this library opened. It was the jewel of the city. Unfortunately, because of some financial issues, it was incomplete in terms of some of the programs that uh, it had. Didn't have an adequate children's area. Now, I don't know if you remember what it was like. It was sort of an embarrassment to have a children's section in which you had to take an elevator or walk down the stairs, by the vending machines, through a dark hallway, and then to a corner of the library, first level. And then uh, you had your book collection mixed in with the adult. I don't mean adult, adult, but I mean, you know, uh, fiction books. We don't have any of those. Uh, so we knew something had to be done to finish. Also, we didn't have adequate parking because we had about 125 spaces on this side of Talbert, and I use the term lightly, street. It wasn't really a street, it was a pitted road. Uh, um, I have relatives in Malvern, Arkansas that have a better road than that. So uh, most of the parking was on the other side, and it was dark. I'm surprised something didn't happen there. So we knew something had to happen with parking. And uh, finally, we didn't have enough meeting space. And all of these were visions of Dion and Richard Neutra and God bless Walter Johnson. What we wanted to do, I had two objectives when I became library director. And one was to get the library to be its own department again. We were part of community services. And uh, that was kind of the dark ages of the library. So we had to step away from that and get to be our own department. We were successful at that. We rolled up our sleeves and we got busy. Friends of the Library were the integral part. Uh, steadfastly stood by us all the way, but we had to branch out more than that. We included, uh, the friend, we started the Friends of the Children's Library because a big push was going to be the Children's Wing. We also had a Library Patrons Foundation, of course the Library Board, we had some arts associations and so on. So we did sort of a coalition. And uh, it's kind of sort of funny. Uh, when we got to the point where we were actually ready to move and we were all excited, we went to a council meeting, they were going to give us some money. And we had like, you know, $11.46 in our book, you know, banking account and anything, but they were going to give us almost a million bucks and we were like, whoa. Well, unfortunately, Chris's pier fell off at the end of the ocean and it dropped into uh, Davy's, I think it was the end of, end cafe. End cafe. Well, it fell off in the end of the ocean. And, uh, they were serving bourbon fries to Davies Locker. There was nothing there. And the city council said, oh, we had to take the money we were going to give to the library and give it to the pier. So we were a little bit um, concerned about that. We had our $11.46 again. So we started from scratch. We rolled up our sleeves again. And uh, during that time also was a recession. And I know we just got rid of the great recession, but every time you go through a recession, it's great. And you go to a council and say, we want to build a library, a children's wing, we advance parking, and a medium room facilities. And they go, yeah, right, and a recession. And we said, no, now's the time to build if you can afford it. And you get great bids. Norma mentioned you get great bids. So they said, yeah, if you can afford it. And I said, we can afford it. So we developed a plan called the Library Service Fund. And I know you just had lunch. I'm not going to get into a financial detail. But it was a, it, the only library that I know in the country that had a non-general fund. You know, general funds which usually play peace and fire and libraries and so on. We, had a, we created a special fund. We had a development fee uh, that we established. So every home that was built in here had to pay 44 cents per square foot. Uh, we rented videos and we had a media department. Um, we, had, uh, we told them we were going to expand that. We were going to have meeting rooms like this one across the hall, the theater. We were going to rent those out. And the friends were going to make some donations. And that fund would also create interest. So we got enough buy-in on that, at least four votes, and they said, go forward. And they said, great, we're ready to go. And uh, as we were building, and I just have a couple more things to say, as we were building across the road, I mentioned Talbert Avenue, the only place we could make enough parking is to get rid of that street. And it 
made sense until we actually went to 15 boards and commissions who said you can't delete Talbert Avenue, it's an ulterior highway, or this congestion, you're removing a highway? No, we're not. <laughs> so what we did is I knew a page that had an old truck, uh, and I said, come on, get your truck out here, and I'm not sure this is even illegal, but that's okay. I'm, I'm retired. <laughs> uh, <laughs> we, <laughs> yeah, we uh, strapped him in, literally bungee corded him, got a video camera, his arms were actually resting on the hood of the uh, you know, cab, and I told him to hit every pothole on that damn road and also go toward the edge. When you go up the hill, um, go as slow as you can. When you go down the hill opposite direction, go as fast as you can. Make it jarring. And two council members were very opposed to this because a couple of their members used that road to get to wherever they wanted to go. So they went to county boards and commissions, they went to this council meeting, and they told us, no way. Well, the night of the council meeting where they're going to decide this, uh, with a little editing, we showed that video. And we also took close-ups of those potholes. And by the time the council members, other than those two, saw that road from hell, they said, no, we ought to get rid of this thing right now. So we got a five to two. Um, those two were never convinced. They were... Um, I said, go ahead and do it. So now there's over 700 parking spaces because of this meeting room. And uh, if, if we didn't anticipate this and have the support of the friends and these other organizations, we'd do it. Oh, just one more thing. I got back from lunch one day, and I know Norman went through all this with, with the Central Library, so many things. And Richard Neutra, we tried to get him to bid on this. We actually, I, I talked to him, and we made sure that every architect, we were very, very concerned to make sure the architects kept in mind the vision of Neutra and as much as possible the, the integrity and the, the, the artistry of the Neutras. Um, what we wanted to do is make the, the, the jewel of the city a crown jewel by, by adding the children's wing and the parking and, and these meeting rooms. So I came in one day after we got the parking uh, established and a bulldozer was stuck upside down almost and someone told us that we hit a petroleum hole and uh, 16 agencies were out there and, and one of the fire inspectors who, and we weren't best friends, he came up to me and said Hayden is going to cost you millions. The project started out costing two million. By this time, we were already up to about nine, and he was wrong. It only cost two million. And we we got uh, environmental permits, got the thing finished, and so on. And when I was walking around, and all this was settled, and we had the grand opening, and so on, I remember leaving my office and going into the children's area, and the God blessed me with two children after the expansion. So I got to find out how the thing worked. And worked pretty good. They started right after my son's going to Stanford and so on, and my daughter's ready to, uh, she's applying to all these uppity schools back east. She's a senior now uh, in high school. So I walked around, I saw the children's wing, I saw the Tabby Storytime Theater, I went downstairs, I saw these meeting rooms occupied, I saw the theater, there was actually something going on there, and parking as far as you could see. And I remember one time at one of these events, a woman and a couple of friends walked up to me and it was a celebration. It was something supposed to be really fun because we were moving, we were actually doing something. And she said, I know what you're doing and it's disgusting. <laughs> and I thought, well, what the heck did she see me do? I, I didn't, I'm a child of the 60s, but I don't do that stuff anymore. I was, I was a, she saw that video. <laughs> I was, addicted to two, I was addicted to two things. One was tennis and the other one was this building. So I, I, I didn't do anything illegal. And she goes, you're painting a mustache on the Mona Lisa. And a mustache on the Mona Lisa. What we were doing was destroying Neutra's design. We're destroying a, the jewel of the city. And she said, we're going to do everything we can to stop this. And again, this was kind of the initial stages. And this is what I'm going to leave you with. I said, go for it. And I told some of the friends, I told the library board, I told them, and I, they told me when they were gonna go to a council meeting, we had four times as many people there. 
And when I got finished walking around the children's, the meeting rooms, seeing the parking, and by the way, the Friends got a pretty expanded area. Uh, they were also tucked away in the corner, and we were able to bring them up front and also expand the book area. So anyway, when I got back in my office, and I kind of thought, you know, I really don't think that we, that there was a mustache on the Mona Lisa. I think that Mona Lisa was here, and she saw what I saw, so she'd have a big smile on her face instead of a mustache. That's it. Yeah. Open, did you imagine something with this kind of permanence, or at least permanence that would last 40 years on like we are today? I thought we'd even have more. Right. Well, we will, I hope. But, but I mean, when you, when you look back, I mean, it's, it feels very strong today. As we know, a lot of libraries today are up against it. They don't have a lot of community support. But I think Central Library, to me, feels very rooted in the community. It feels like there's a lot of support. It feels like it's going to be here a long time. I mean, looking at it today, are you happy with the progress that's been made here, the evolution of it? Talk a little bit about what you saw that day in 75 and what you see today when you walk in. <laughs> <laughs> well, one of the things I love seeing are my former students studying. <laughs> and a lot of the students from Cal State Long Beach used to love to come here because of the quiet, because of the water, and, uh, oh, and the students from the high schools and the colleges. And I always, I thought that was terrific. And I really never thought we would be less than what we were at that time. In fact, I thought we'd be more, and the thing that I just remembered now, when you mentioned Ray Bradbury, well, at the dedication um, of the library, we all asked Ray Bradbury to be the speaker, and he consented, and we were thrilled that he was going to be the speaker at this big event. Guess what? He got sick, so he couldn't be the speaker. And then the council said, okay, Norma, you're going to be the speaker. <laughs> I said, I am? He said, yes, you can speak. I said, well, I know I can speak, but this is a big event. Well, I found that speech about a month ago, and it was good. <laughs> <laughs> Stephanie, I meant to bring it yeah. to you. I said I would. Yeah, I meant to bring it to you. But I never got acknowledged for it because all the programs say Red Bradbury. <laughs> and, uh, well, we can remedy that. All of that. It doesn't matter, but it was just sort of funny. Yeah. No, I think we're doing great. And I'm looking for even bigger and better things like the Senior Center coming in. Sharon, mm -hmm. how about you when you think back to 40 years ago compared to what you see today when you walk in? Oh, I think it's wonderful. I think that. It is the best building in town, by a long shot. Mm -hmm. <laughs> and it is probably the most used. It, everybody loves it. I have never heard anybody that said they didn't like the exterior, interior of the library. I think putting the books in the core, in the central core of the library was wonderful and all the windows and I'm sorry the lake is gone but maybe someday it'll come back. Next year it'll um, come back. I was also, this is kind of a negative thing to say, but there was someone on the console who came in and took all the credit. <laughs> and she <laughs> that console person had actually um, campaigned against the library saying it was being built on peat and that it would it was, it was would sink the slower end. We had two people on that council who kept saying we're, the library yeah. is sinking, what are we going to do about it? And I ran to Walter Johnson and I needed some confidence that everything was going well and he said, Charlene, when the windows in the back break, we'll know we're sinking. <laughs> well, they're still there. <laughs> this book is going to be really good. I'm doing the book by the library. I just decided because I want to dig into the <laughs> council person that <laughs> took that credit, not you. Ron, you made some news a number of years ago. Sort of when cell phones were first kind of becoming ubiquitous, 
um, there was a, I guess a law, we can call it a law, a rule here, implemented at the library, that made a lot of, a lot of press that I think was a $150 fine if you were caught on your phone in the library. Now, I actually love that because this was a time when we were first beginning to see the interruptive behavior of what phones did. You couldn't have conversations, how all of a sudden you were listening to conversations you were no part of. And the last, you know, the last sanctuary, the library, was all of a sudden being infiltrated with these conversations. And you did something that got a lot of press. It was very polarizing. Talk about it, because I think even though it may not have been implemented, just the idea that you were doing it sent a message out and seemed to take care of the problem. Well, it was implemented, and we don't monkey around. It wasn't 150 it was $1,000. So, <laughs> um, yeah, it was an ordinance. And that wasn't the intent. The intent was to get the reaction you just gave. Is whoa, you gotta be kidding. Um, what was happening is the people were coming in, I explained earlier, that uh, some people would come to the front desk and we have staff and we're busy, and they would answer their phone while our staff's trying to assist them. And as if we're gonna wait for them. Uh -uh. So uh, I heard that enough, I went to the city attorney's office and give us something that would get their attention. So they had an ordinance. I didn't think it was that big of a deal. I'm not a phone person, and my phone is so old that, I mean, my, my kids have the current iPhone and all stuff. I, you know, anyhow, I didn't care. But obviously, that's people's lives. And um, back then, uh, we thought, again, we would get their attention. So I mentioned it at a department head meeting, and the public information officer said, whoa, time out. we got to get press release on this. And I said, yeah, just do it. So we implemented it, and it got people's attention. Uh, I was talking about one incident where there was one young lady who wanted to play the system. And uh, we had security who would uh, interrupt her when she was at the front desk. And she would go then to a study area and use her phone, and he would um, remind her. When it got to the third time, we contacted the police, and the officer who came, I personally met him, and he goes, you gotta be kidding me. You want me to do what? A thousand dollars? And I said, well, just, let's get their attention. So we put her in the conference room, and uh, this was a big guy. And she was, you know, she was a small woman, girl, and he got in and said, you got a thousand dollars on you? Are you gonna do this again? Said, no. Are you gonna tell your friends? Yeah. So uh, it didn't stop it. And what it did, it gave the staff an opportunity to say, don't do this, instead of just saying, or else, we can say, don't do this, or we can call the police and you could be out a thousand dollars. It's actually an ordinance. And you know, if they don't do it, they can get a warrant for the arrest and so on. We were, we were pretty big on that. People who didn't return the books, this is much more important. People who, didn't, who had late books, we would take them to small claims court. And the judge had, I mean, the first, the first time, uh, the, most of the people wouldn't show up. So we would get- This is Boardwalk Empire. <laughs> <laughs> We would not only get their money eventually because the credit card or the credit would be, um, you know, negatively impacted. So we would uh, they, we would get a fine and we would get their money, and that got a lot of play. And you, you couldn't imagine how many people started turning in their books. I, cu um, I currently have two late books. <laughs> <laughs> I'm sitting here listening, worried. I'm sure his name was on the list. <laughs> But anyway, other than but that, we've never had a problem. I mean, you were, you, I mean, you were on television, you were on the radio. It was a big deal when it, it happened. It was. I, I, I went on some talk show, and um, <laughs> there was an audience there, and I couldn't believe this. It was, it was on the internet. People were coming in and said, look, this is Asia. I go, good grief, it's a phone. And uh, what was kind of funny is that when I was on the talk show, it was one of those things, kind of like Bill O'Reilly thing or something like it, where you have uh, uh, two positions. And so they wanted to get an opponent in the city, but they couldn't find one because <laughs> everyone was sick of people using their phones to interrupt business. So they just got someone from the audience and sort of made stuff up. Um, but I couldn't believe it. I had, you know, went to some place and, and we videotaped this thing and it was, it was amazing. Does, does the ordinance does it still stand? Is it still on the books here in Huntington Beach? Yeah. Yes, yes, unless yes, unless it is. It's we took it off. It's still on the books. It's still on the books. HB 1320, yeah. I believe. Yeah. HB 1320, yeah. I think. Yeah. Yeah. yeah, we can still we can still implement it. Yeah, but we can still enforce it if we want to. Um, 
but most people respect the fact that we ask them to take the conversation outside. Yeah, well, I think what's happened too is society is sort of not that we sort of shame people that do that, but I think collectively we don't like it. I mean, generally, common sense people don't like to see that. So there's sort of a, an unspoken pressure you can put on people, not dragging them to a room with <laughs> one time, <laughs> not against, one time. but no. Um, but thank you for sharing that, Ronnie. Because again, I, I do think it was an interesting part of Huntington Beach history right. and library history. To the three of you, um, all given your your vast experience here, talk a little about a little bit each of you about how you used the library yourselves with your families. You were all integral in the development of it, but how did you use it as citizens? Did you bring your kids here a lot? Did you, was it something you used regularly as citizens beyond what you did here as, as volunteers and organizers? Well, um, my great-grandson here thinks it's the most wonderful place, which is good, right? <laughs> well, that's a great answer right there. He's right. living proof of that right there. So, um, and I belong with Norma to a book club, and we always try to make sure that the books are here. Sometimes there's not enough for all of us, but we do fairly well. And um, so we're here at least once a month and uh, do some reading on our side and I encourage my dear husband Ralph to empty some of our book shelves <laughs> and bring them to the library but he's kind of anal and he's not <laughs> <laughs> the shelves We're are learning really so down. much today <laughs> Norma, Norma, how about you? After the library opened, were you oh, oh dear, that was funny. <laughs> well, I I thought that the used book section was absolutely marvelous, <clears throat> and I would go and I would bring back a ba bag of books. However, the family has gotten on to me, and so now they say, if you're going to the library, you have to bring a bag to the library before you bring two bags back. <laughs> and uh, it really doesn't work because I love books. And I'll give you an aside. When I was a professor at Cal State Long Beach, the fire marshal came in on an earthquake thing and he came into my office and I had put on sh uh, bookshelves all around and my desk was in the center. And he looked at it and he said, oh my. Oh my, Miss Gibbs, we had an earthquake and these books fell on you. You know, you would die. And I looked up and I said, can you think of a better way to go? <laughs> and he looked at me and he said, forget it. <laughs> Juan, how about you? Were, were your family, were they here a lot? Was, was the library something you used on a regular basis, even though you were working here today? No, in fact, my parents were, uh, well, they were in the Great Depression, and they didn't finish, finish grammar school. We didn't have any books in our house, and uh, I did not grow up around libraries. It's something that I learned uh, later on. Uh, not that this happened very often, but when I'd get in trouble, I would go to libraries. It was some way you could escape. Uh, back in those days, the early late 60s, early 70s, I mean, I would have voted for Bernie Sanders. I, I, I didn't want, uh, I, I didn't like cap capitalism that much. I, I, I was against the Vietnam War. Um, I, I thought being in a library was a great place to be because it's a place that you can go and prove yourself. This is BI before the internet, uh, where the whole world is opened up to you. So I, um, once I walked in those doors and started as a page and then, you know, worked way up. Uh, I wanted to continue with that. And my children, as I said earlier, uh, God bless them, to I very late comer, I, I son at 45, and it happened to be the same year that the, like, the children's wing opened up. So I could see very closely how, uh, how the children's wing worked. And they attended, and my, my wife goes, I, she, when she'd go to the library, oh my, I said, did you save any books for other people? She would just have a huge hand, and we'd read to them all the time, same thing with my daughter. So it's an integral part. Um, my wife uh, works in the library now at uh, my daughter's high school. And um, it's, I would have to say that after I retired, I, I didn't use it quite as much. 
Uh, people like Ralph Bauer and Shirley Detloff, the council tired me out. I didn't want anything to do with cities for a while. So uh, I'm, I'm sort of, uh, I, I, my favorite place now is Doggy Beach with my little lab and Shih Tzu. So, uh, but, but still, the, the principle of libraries being an important part, and that's again why we concentrated on a meeting place uh, so people can go and get away and study and get a place of quiet to contemplate, read, and so on, is still so important. So it's very, very important. And lastly, for everybody, a question, Sean? Oh, I was going to add that Ray Bradbury, who was not a college graduate or a high school graduate, always said the library was yes, he did. a the university of the poor. And that's true. Does it take much to get a card and start reading? Yeah. yeah, and he, I mean, I was, when I was younger, um, a mentor of mine was a writer, John Cheever, if you know the fiction writer, where I grew up in New York, and he used to go give, at the local Austining Library, John Cheever would go do readings from his books, if you believe, he would take me along when I was a kid. And he told me once, we walked in, just the, just the two of us would go, and he said, you know, he said, there's something very calming about walking into a library and knowing your books are in there. And it didn't really make sense to me. He goes, just, and, I, and I said, what do you mean? He goes, well, you know, when you live in a neighborhood, it's just nice to know the things you've worked on are sort of within reach and your friends in the community can, can have that there. I, have, I love knowing books I've written are here, and I know exactly what he's talking about now. Your own library is so special and sacred to those you know. If you've worked on something and it happens to live on the shelf, it really is a very emotional uh, thing when you realize that that thing that started on a piece of paper in your house, whatever, is now on a shelf in your favorite place in town. It is a very powerful um, sensation. But I would ask lastly, what would your message be to people about how, to, how does the library remain vital and thriving? I mean, again, the digital age has been very brutal on, on libraries and the library system. What do you think from your expertise people can do or people can take from today and share with others about making sure this place doesn't just stay here but thrives and grows and evolves? I think be a friend of the library <laughs> and then get involved in some of the activities, whether it's setting the table or shelving a book or buying a cookbook. That's a really <laughs> tip of the day is that they have wonderful cookbooks that are selling for $2 that are $30. So uh, I get first dibs. <laughs> Norma, what would you add to what people can do today to sort of make sure the library stays as strong as we need? They can do uh, everything that we have been doing, what we've been talking about, but everybody has to do their own thing. And those of us who are real book lovers, um, this is just automatic. But I like the idea of what Ron was saying, if you expose the kids early enough, they will, that becomes a habit. And there are some very good habits to have, and book loving is one. I think the Friends of the Library, the Children's Library, everything that is connected with the library, people can volunteer, and the door is wide open for volunteers. And by the way, when you get retired, like I've been retired, my kids would say, well, Mom, we thought we'd see more of you when you retired. I said, I'm as busy as ever. <laughs> but at this point, I don't get paid for anything. <laughs> but I volunteer up the gazoo, and as long as I'm able to, and I'm still breathing and can walk around, I shall. Excellent. And Ron, what would you add to that as far as what people can do or should do? Yeah, I would say that the most common reaction from people when I meet them and they say, Look, what, are you, what have you done? What are you doing? I said, I was a librarian. Our library director, and I said, Good grief, uh, what do you need libraries for? Kind of what the council members said 50 years ago, 70 years ago, with the internet, when you need libraries. And I <clears throat> restrained from strangling them. And <laughs> this is why, again, that we focused the expansion uh, on the children's wing because we want to capture them at an early age, as Norma just mentioned. But also, when you walk in the doors of a library, it's so different than, I mean, it is so special. It's, it's not only books, like I said, it's a meeting space, it's a place you can get away. You can't do it in your kitchen, you can't do it on your couch the same as you can in a library. Uh, as, as, at least as hopeless as I'm along, along, there's still gonna be books, but it may be in a digital format, I don't know. But, you know, there's five things people pay their taxes for, and God willing, there's always gonna be five things. Please, fire, public works, parks, and libraries. So that's 
we're one of the big five, and I hope we're always one of the big five. People like the Friends of the Library, Friends of the Children's Library, because we get them at an early age, and the library board. Um, we can continue. We can convince others to get in that door and experience the environment of the library. And Warm it's air-conditioned. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> right? <laughs> Norma, Ron, and Charlene, thank you very much. Thank you all for coming to the Human Support in the Library. The library is a magical, inspirational, and transformational place, and we owe so much to the Friends of the Library for helping us make that space available for everybody in the community.